Very good evening and a warm welcome to this virtual thought leadership meeting by NHRDN. Across the globe and in India, of course, we see more companies are hiring chief well-being officers, directors of employee well-being like never before. And uh, this pandemic has accelerated well-being as a key organizational and leadership priority where the CEO went from being the chief executive officer to becoming the chief empathy officer. Today, employee well-being is a key ingredient of a good EVP or an employee value proposition without which the EVP in itself is seen as incomplete. With all this emphasis on holistic well-being, leaders must also learn to take care of themselves and to borrow the words of both Dr. T.V. Rao, who said this a decade ago, and Josh Burson, who has said this recently in his Reset Playbook, the need for human-centric leadership, which also looks at the employee health and well-being holistically, has gained a lot of importance and will stay that way for the near future. So in the next 40-odd uh, minutes, we'll dwell deep into this topic of leadership and well-being, why it matters. I am Lionel Paul David, president of NHRD in Chennai chapter. And joining me today in this fireside chat is Mr. Himanshu Saxena, the founder and CEO, Center for Center of Sorry, Center of Strategic Mindset. To introduce Himanshu in a nutshell, is a prolific thinker, writer, speaker, and coach. And he's featured among the world's top 100 coaches in strategy and culture. He's also a mindfulness practitioner, which brings, uh, which adds to his repertoire, a very vast experience uh, that ranges from coaching to being a mindfulness practitioner. He's also done uh, multiple things in between. Interestingly, that spans across six successful career transitions and an experience that cuts across different geographies. Himanshu, thank you for accepting our invitation and for joining us today. My pleasure, Lionel. Absolutely excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So along with your opening remarks on this topic, I would like to have your views as someone who has worked extensively on organizational culture. How do you define a healthy workplace? Do you see a connection between employee well-being and organizational culture. How has this topic of well-being evolved over the years in the corporate world in your view? Thank you, Lionel, for asking a wonderful question. And you know, the best way to respond to this question is to invoke the poem by Tagore, who said, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free and the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. I think these two lines of the wonderful poem really describe a healthy workplace. And you know, over the years, I've been able to arrive at three measuring criteria of a healthy workplace. The first being in a healthy atmosphere or healthy workplace, people are seen winning together and not winning against each other. Because when a vision is there and synergy is there, a great healthy workplace, people tend to win together and not compete among themselves. And winning against each other happens when the vision is not there and the clarity on the part of leadership is missing. The second is where people can operate without fear and take the responsibility of what they say, think and act. It's like owning my thinking and communication. And third and lastly, a healthy atmosphere promotes creative experiments, control failures, and most importantly, it facilitates challenging of assumptions. I always say assumptions are the least form of knowledge. So if people can be empowered to ask questions, I think assumptions are taken care of. So these are some of the ways I see a healthy workplace manifesting. 
Now, question about do I see a connection between employee well-being and org culture? Well, to my mind, this question does not even warrant a binary yes or no. The answer is very much clear. It is a yes. See, an employee well-being is a state of mind which has an impact on the morale of an individual and the morale of the organization. And Lionel, it determines the mood of an organization. I often say well-being is directly proportional to the mood meter of the organization. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think you nicely put saying not divided by walls, especially uh, post the pandemic, everyone is in a box. Uh, whether you're wor virtually working or physically working. So that's one. And uh, of course, winning together, uh, the emphasis on that, especially when companies are ex uh, experimenting with uh, digital, virtual, and all sorts of working models uh, becomes important than ever before. And uh, if people can come together and express their creativity, they'll find their own purpose and place in the organization, which will define the uh, healthy workplace. So thanks for that. Now, uh, my next question to you would be, the pandemic has put the traditional workspace under the microscope. A uh, lot of things have changed, uh, including uh, both employers and employees who want certainty, but the industries and sectors are operating in a very uncertain times. So what are your views on how employee well-being becomes a strategic priority of organizations and also the strategic priority of leadership in such a scenario? Yeah. And how much will it remain a priority in the foreseeable future with markets and economies becoming increasingly conscious of the ESG risks? Thank you, Leonard. And before I answer this question, I think the part of your previous question is still in my mind, where you spoke about the evolution of well-being over the years. Uh, see, the well-being has always been relevant ever since the Vedic period of time, but its importance has quite gone up uh, expon exponentially, especially in the last one and a half decade. And this is mainly attributed to a couple of factors. One is the implosion of social media. So, you know, with social media comes the power of judgment, opinions, and leading to greater insecurities. And when we have greater insecurities surrounding us, I think our well being takes a toll. The second part is the fast paced life with multiple distractions leading to deprioritization of self. Now, if we take ourselves out from the equation of life, how are we going to remain? A effective in our pursuit. And third is taking too many things personally. Anybody, anyone say something, we tend to take things too personally. So from that perspective, the well-being equation or the challenge have really evolved over a period of time. Now coming to the question is, uh, you know, pandemic was or has given us a huge wake up call. It was kind of a rude shock for us who took everything for granted, including Mother Nature. Our priorities changed significantly during pandemic and survival became a key focus area. I remember us to do a lot of webinars just to keep the community going and motivating. And I often used to speak about three things, preserve, conserve, and reserve, because there will be a future. So how do you take care of yourself in those time will actually set you up like in stock market, when things are down, how do you prepare yourself for the next rebound? So and to that extent, I, I think this is how it changed our lens. Now, I don't see leaders and organizations going back on their focus on well-being. Uh, to that extent, it's pretty much an irreversible uh, trend. But the degree or intensity may vary, and depending upon the leadership, as well as the vision of the organization. See, in my work uh, of facilitating and visioning strategy, culture, leadership work, well-being does feature as a key priority. But what organizations are struggling with is how to dovetail simple basic well-being practices into the mainstream operations. And that too in a day-to-day -day life. 
So the focus will continue, but I think a lot more innovation is needed to make well-being an achievable, practicable, and implementable pursuit. Leona. Great. I, I think uh, you nicely put saying like, uh, while it's a leadership and organizational priority, uh, the issue is with making it practical, something that is practicable, and that is part of the routine. And uh, uh, that brings me to the next question where I recall you speaking about in one of your posts where you said in a Marshall Goldsmith 100 coaches call where there was a discussion on aspiration versus achievement paradox or achievement spectrum and a thought that caught your imagination are my aspirations fueling me or burning me out. So burnout is a very hot topic these days. And uh, as a mindfulness practitioner and as a leadership coach, what is your observation on burnout and leaders? And what mm -hmm. are some of the trends that you have observed? Well, that's a great question. You know, as an entrepreneur and as a coach, these days I work 15 to 16 hours. But so does Mr. Modi and so does Gautam Adani and so many others. And when I try to decode that, uh, the, the key observations are like, is, there, is our ambition driven by an inner flame or driven by external comparison that oh, I need to be there or I want to be like so and so? So this is the dividing line. Are we driven by inner flame purpose or passion or are we in some kind of influence under external comparison? And I find more often than not, many leaders are driven by external or peer comparison. Now, Leonel, it's hard to not get burnt out if the incentives and motivations are external. So that's my first point. The second one is uh, people, I find chasing too many things at one point of time. See, our universe is rigged to facilitate our success if we focus on few big things. I often advocate a concept of big five in next five. So it implies that what are our five big things that we tend, we need to achieve in the next five years and really become great at and attain mastery. Then I prompt people, okay, if you identify the big five in the next five, what are the five things that you want to do in the one year? What are the five things you want to do in quarter one, two, three, and four? What are the five things you want to do in this month? What are the five things you want to do in this particular week? And eventually boiling it down to what are the five things that we need to do on this day? Now the challenge or the beauty lies if we can link the five of the day to a week, to a quarter, to a year and five year. This is where magic happens. And this is, this is the beauty of execution and uh, the power of magic. So that is why I said universe is rigged to give you success if you focus on few things. This third one is, I see our entire approach to life is focused on identifying what we need to do and what we need to do more. I hardly see any initiatives on identifying what not to do. I picked up this phrase from somewhere called the law of planned neglect, which means I have to plan what I'll, I need to neglect. And I really love this phrase that in my life, do I have certain things which I'm ensuring a planned neglect that I don't want to do these things. So these are some of the observations which often lead to burnout. And if some of these are eliminated, I think uh, it's a lot more aspirational rather than a burnout thing. Yeah, the long working hours uh, after the physical disconnect from workplace has long gone for many. Uh, I think these are very useful tips. And uh, the most profound one is to have a not to do list, which helps us to plan to neglect the big five and next five so that like we cut to the chaos to things that are most important to us. So, and it will always uh, take more time to identify yeah. one of the five things. Right. And uh, on the other side, 
all these near term pressures in society i'm just picking it up from your last question also it's connected the near term pressures in today's society because companies have start stop giving forecasts which are for 5 years and 3 years and move to a quarter by quarter or a month by month forecast uh, with all these near term pressures in today's society and business uh, it it's very difficult to find the right equilibrium between achieving those long term goals as well as short term financial metrics in an organization so what are some of the mindful leadership practices managers today can start with to take care of their well being as well as their teams this also connects back to your previous statement where to make it implementable or actionable is the challenge so what what are some of your suggestions what are some of the practices that people can start yeah. with you know i i love to use this phrase how to find your center in a spinning world in many ways that is mindfulness because there's a whole lot of chaos going on and how do i keep myself centered in that spinning world so firstly lionel there is no such static or constant equilibrium that exists it is always a shifting balance or a dynamic equilibrium that we can strive to achieve that means at some point of time somewhere we may have to lean but our job is to like the rudder of a plane you have to pull it back and and breathing and conscious identification is the key now to achieve that we require four or five things number one is a vision which is related to big five and next five uh, second is a set of strategic priorities and most important thing is a daily discipline i call it what is your spiritual discipline it's got nothing to do with religion it's your spiritual discipline see vision provides us destination direction and impact in which destination we have to go which direction we want to achieve what is the impact we want to create is strategic priorities our big five and we need more time to identify them rather than getting carried away or being pulled in all the directions that account of temptations fleeting opportunities and low hanging fruits lastly what is our minimum viable unit of time and minimal minimum viable unit of time is a day and day is what is visible so how do we plan our day is a very important facet that goes and helps us attaining the equilibrium between uh, long term and short term now the cycle of five that i shared with you i i think if we keep focus on that and how do we plan our day around those five things i think to a great extent we can achieve that equilibrium and at the end of the day when we hit the pillow we'll have the least amount of guilt and regret because maybe three things out of those important five we are done i think one can get a good sleep can you explain and expand on that spiritual discipline yeah. which you said not religious so spiritual discipline like how i plan my day for example um, my day begins at around quarter to 5 or 5 part of the 5 am club i go to kitchen and uh, have my glass of warm water with uh, neem and haldi okay and then i do some basic stretching exercise i look at my calendar and schedule so that my five things remain important um then i do some back extension exercise because energy is the source of whatever you want to achieve and our spine is the storehouse of the energy so if we don't take care of our back uh, i think it's not going to help us survive then simple things uh, how after 40 40 minutes so i have an alarm in my mobile which i call it back care so after 40 minutes i have to get up and do some activity then those glasses of water the other thing which i do in my part of spiritual discipline is a practice which i created leonel i call it five breath of choices so when i begin my day Um, as part of my pranayam i count five particular breath and i associate them with something now the first breath of choice is of gratitude so i take a long deep breath inhale gently deeply while inhaling i be grateful to whatever i have in life so that's my first breath of choice 
The second breath of choice is uh, renewal because each day is new. And if I have woken up today, it's a new day for me. So I take breath to invoke, oh, I'm a new me today. And that brings a little more consciousness. The third is the breath of hope and positivity. So I take a long, deep breath and I say, why should I not be hopeful and optimistic for day? It's a new day, a new sunshine. So that's my third breath of choice. The fourth one is a, a breath of letting go. So I take a deep breath and I said, okay, now whatever has happened, it's a gone thing. So if I'm holding on to certain, some problems, some pains, it's not going to help. So take a deep breath, release and let it go. And finally is the breath of forgiveness. Most importantly, forgiving myself, then forgiving others, and then forgiving the world at large. Now these five breath of choices are a great mindful practice to begin my day. It just keeps me in a wonderful state of mind. So uh, can you also uh, spend about a minute or two to expand, like you gave some tips for leadership practices, but as a leader, when they are trying to influence their teams, simple, small things that they can, uh, you know, nudge their team to do. Yeah. You know, I was interviewing Alan Malali, who is the CEO of Ford and Boeing, and I picked up this thing from him as part of his programming that he got in life. And he said, one of the programmings that I received in my life was from my mom. Uh, and he said, she made this statement, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. I found it very powerful. So whichever word you are in, whether with your team, whether in a negotiation situation or a merger acquisition deal, or even a terrorist negotiation, I think if we can spend time to seek to understand first, it actually enhances our chances of influencing the world around us. And that calls for listening without judgment, asking questions that can make the person think. I often say this, Lionel, people buy you first before they buy from you. So how can be your most authentic yourself and lead with that paradigm then you find people getting influenced by whatever you want to say. And some of the other stuff, it's about clarity of thought process because people will come to you if we have the clarity of thought process. People will come to us if we are ingenuous. People will come to us if we are authentic. People will come to us if we have the ability to reframe the way they think. And that is thought leadership. So these are some of the tips which can help us to be a very good influencer. Thank you. So leaders today are expected to lead with uh, increased self-awareness, empathy, self-regulation, and social aptitude. So once they start their mindfulness journey, what are the next steps and goals that they should set for themselves? And uh, what are some of the successful routines that you have seen uh, leaders practice. You, you mentioned about Alan Mulale, but I'm sure you had opportunity to interact with so many other leaders. So what are some of the routines you've seen the most successful leaders practice? And what are the benefits that you've seen them recap? Thank you. Let me take them one by one. Um, you're talking about once a person is embarked on the journey, how do you take the next set of steps? Right. So mindfulness is a, and well-being is a continuum. Each day is designed for an assault on us, assault on our thinking, assault on our emotions, assault on the way we exist. So that means each day we need to replenish ourselves. And that is why at the beginning of the day, I exercise that five breath of choices. So there has to be a certain thing which are as if continuum. Now, once we attain that basic DNA, or let's call it a baseline. How can we take this game up? Number one is to help more and judge less. It's a very hard thing to do. It begins right from home. So how do we identify situations where we catch ourselves judging and then we have to pull it back? So remember, 
an invisible tagline always dangling in front of us, which is telling us, Imanshu, help more, judge less. And we need that reminder all the time. So end of each day and a set of activities that we indulge in are designed to create some biases. And our job is to get rid of them. How? And not on Holy, Diwali, Christmas, and New Year. Every day. So this is my personal practice journal. And I'm taking a shower. And uh, while taking a shower, I'm actually also showering myself with the previous day bias. At least I think in the direction, that consciousness, that my shower will not be complete if I don't shower away the biases of yesterday. Number two. And understanding that people are there for themselves, they are not necessarily against you. I remember a wonderful story. So I was driving uh, 2019. Uh, I think I had taken a cab from JFK and uh, I think Route 91, it was on full speed. Suddenly after some time, I saw my cab applying brakes and suddenly stopping. And then I realized there was a commotion and the car in front of me had applied the brake and there was a blue bull which is crossing the road and that is how the traffic was brought to a halt. Now, our driver actually stopped the car a feet or two away from the car in front. But the guy in front had a possibly a bad day, so he came out shouting and he really started abusing this Afro-American Uber driver, cab driver, very badly, with gestures, middle finger, abuses and everything. And you know, our driver or my driver was really apologetic, though there was no fault of his, and he was smiling gently, not with a smile. So after some time, a lot of honking began, and that guy realized that this guy is not giving me any reaction, so no point shouting. So he gave a final blast and he moved on, and that's all we resumed. And I asked him, I don't remember his name. I said, listen, buddy, there was no fault of yours. Why did you take this shit from this guy? You know what he said? It really changed and gave me a great perspective. He said, people have a lot of garbage in their mind. And they're looking for a garbage bin to dump. And I just chose to be one for him. And my job is to make sure that I don't pass this shit to somebody else. So I have to break this vicious cycle of passing this nonsense. I think to me, that was a great mindful practice that this guy demonstrated. So when I said people are there for themselves, they're not necessarily against you. So in this case, the guy had something in his mind and he just chose to blurt it out and vent it out on this fellow. So this is where our responsibility comes and how do we react to that? And one of the greatest mindfulness practice is to not react, but to take one deep breath and respond. The third thing is uh, people can do to enhance their mindfulness is take their listening to a new level. In our coaching, we define different levels of listening. One is plain hearing. Second is active listening. Um, third is deep listening and the fourth one is called just being there you are so there that the other guy can resonate himself in you as a mirror that's the highest quality of listening so uh, which means we are able to shut off our inner chatter as well as external noise there's nothing to interpret nothing to judge nothing to conclude just being there so I think all of us can do a fantastic job in taking a listening uh, to the next level. The third thing is, uh, how do we use pause very effectively? So we need not measure our success through the rush of things. I think some of the greatest things are achieved in a very mindful pause. So these are some of the steps that come to my mind. Now your question about what are the kind of routines that successful leaders I have seen practice? Effective leaders often design an ecosystem of inspiration around them. I know somebody who says, oh, every day I listen to the same song because I grew up listening to this song and I really find peace in that. I do have a song which I listen almost daily. 
they are mindful to say no to an unwarranted, unsolicited trigger and stay on their wave files. If you've seen the movie Invictus, and if anyone has seen the movie Invictus, there is a scene where Nelson Mandela was the role played by Morgan Freeman. He walks in to the office day one. It's called Madiba's first day. Now he see white people packing the bags, trying to leave because the government has changed. And his secretary comes, whose name is uh, Brenda. And she tries to say, uh, we got to have a cabinet meeting. And he says, uh, Brenda, give me one moment. So how do we exercise that one moment to retain our cohesion? That is a wonderful step. And the third one is they don't take things personally and are very, very secured in their skin and are sure-footed on ground and no one can assert or hijack them. So these are some of the routines that I've seen uh, in, in my life, people that I've worked. And some of the common benefits that I've seen them reaping is they are far less stressed. And that's the purpose of this entire uh, webinar that we are doing. I often say, accept what you can't and change what you can. It's a very simple mindful practice. In every situation we can apply, accept what I can't and change what I can. These leaders are seen to be in charge of their thinking, choices, as well as action. So there is nobody who's able to rush them. They will always take that 30 seconds, which we are authorized to do, but we just don't do that. And uh, they become very agile. I remember of a CEO who had attended a funeral during COVID time, let's say at 11 o'clock. He was my coachy, And he said, Imachu, in one hour, I have to attend a celebration of someone who's getting promoted. So how do I manage this? I'm just coming from a funeral where I lost somebody very dear. So I heard him and I asked him, what is the fault of the guy who's celebrating promotion? And if you happen to be the leader, you'll have to develop this skill called compartmentalize and reset. And one of the great mindful practice is to compartmentalize and reset. I hope I was able to answer your question. Great. So compartmentalize and reset. So can, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that before we move to the next question? Yeah, I'll, I'll use that same example. The guy who's lost, you did your full justice by being at funeral. funeral. Okay. Now, you have a next event which requires a different emotion. So you have to compartmentalize the emotions related to that incident. Localize it. Take charge and regroup yourself for the next event. The show has to go on, that's life. If something bad happens, how long do you want to brood over it? So any negative thought which has been triggered by a situation, a question that I ask myself, what is the utility or futility of this thought? And that straight away helps me snap out of that emotion. So I see a question from uh, Mr. Venkat Narayanan, who's the CHR of Rane Group. Uh, any guidance and practices to develop such skills? Start with small, small things at home. For example, something happens uh, at home with your children or with your spouse, and that has led to a particular state of mind. Just ask this question, how much time do I need to spend? And is that the best utilization of my time? And that is where this utility or futility of thought will trigger. Uh, Mr. Venkat, you know, just imagine yourself in our body, there is an elevator. Let's call it an emotional elevator. Now, when someone says something good, the elevator goes up. When someone says something really nasty, bad, the elevator goes down. When someone says something really nasty, the elevator goes to the basement and takes a long time to come. So what an irony of life, the elevator is in our body, but the control of elevator, we are giving it to others' hand. And we need to get that control back. So it's the mindfulness or the conscious that where my thoughts are taking me. 
and that orientation helps us regain our active consciousness to come back to what is relevant now. Great. Uh, we, I'm just moving to the to my last question to Manshu, and if others have any questions. Uh, you can either put it on chat or maybe you can ask it right after Himanshu answers this question. You've led uh, six successful career transitions spanning across exploration geology, armed forces, United Nations, consulting, corporations, and now entrepreneurship. And you also explored various national cultures. How is mental well being, which is currently a global concern? is being addressed by corporate India. And what are some of the lessons that we can borrow from other countries and what other countries can learn from us about combating this issue? Thank you. You know, I always say strong opinions are an outcome of narrow exposure. Luckily, life has given me broad exposure. So I don't have too many strong opinions because each context uh, demand something which is relatable to that particular situation. Now, different companies are addressing it differently, but what has fundamentally changed is that number one, the awareness towards well being has gone up significantly high. And that's a good sign. So people are realizing that if an employee is not having a good well being, somewhere it's going to show up in their bottom line and top line. Secondly, the theme is gaining top leadership attention and is being treated as a strategic priority in some companies, not all. But I think it's good that few companies do that because they become role model for others. What is missing out is a coherent, comprehensive, well-designed approach. So what happens in one particular business unit, it happens in a different way. In other unit, it happens different way. Now, I'm okay for variations in the approach, but what needs to be done is very important. So there is a need for a unified thing that each company needs to define that what does well-being mean for us? What are those four or five things which are important to ensure well-being? Now, some of the lessons that I'm able to borrow from other countries and companies and different cultures is, uh, number one, West is focused on productivity. When you're working, you're solely dedicated to the work. So there is a different way eight hours are devoted on work. People are very glued up, focused in what they do. They do not waste time or indulge in something uh, which, which is leading to frittering away of five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes here. They're very, very focused. I think that's worth borrowing. And I often wonder that if I put eight hours in a dedicated manner, I think I should be able to do a 12 hours of work, which otherwise you would do. So that's one practice to be borrowed from the West. Um, in India, it does not happen. And there is a fair bit of laxity or different way of interpreting work. As a result, people, somewhere maybe people are tuned to 14 hours to work. So I can take a little bit of time here and then, and that's okay. What the world can borrow from us is the perspective that the quality of life depends upon the quality of living. And the quality of living depends upon the quality of breath. So how we breathe, the basic concept of pranayama, uh, it can really influence or shape our ability to absorb, process, and respond. I'll give you a small example. Three years ago, I was in a meeting which was restarted at three o'clock with a very senior leader of a large consulting firm. The gentleman arrived at three o'clock and uh, I could see him a little drowsy and tired. And uh, maybe during the day in back-to-back -back meetings, he forgot to take water. He forgot to eat something and you could see his energy and the sugar levels going down. Lionel, I always carry a little bit of some food item in my bag. So I took out something and gave it to him and he felt very nice after that. So how could we be so unmindful that we don't tap or monitor where our energy levels are going? Simple things like drinking water every 40 minutes or so or 
going to the corner, making some moments. These are some great practices to achieve. There is a guy who I coached uh, at 32 years of age. He developed a kidney stone. Later on, the analysis revealed that back-to-back -back meetings, he's an investment banker, would actually deplete him of hydration and he would not take water. And we all know the water does not go, or the kidney is not working at its peak optimum efficiency. So we have a choice and we have a situation that we need to take charge of the triggers that our body is revealing. So some of the things both sides of the world and culture can take from each other. What is India has to offer is the entire concept of breath towards the quality of life, which we don't do also. It's only now when the global expansion consciousness is going, we're getting alive to that. And, uh, you know, there is a very famous quote by Viktor Frankl, uh, the famous uh, Holocaust survivor. And I'm just going to recount that uh, quote. He says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. What a powerful quote. And if someone asks me, what do I mean by that space? That space is one conscious breath that we forget to take. Sometimes we just need to tell, oh, have I taken a conscious breath? Am I even aware or I'm just letting it run in auto default, autopilot mode? Thanks, thanks Imanshu for all those insights. Uh, power packed in about 40 minutes. And uh, I see a question from Anuradha Kumar who's the central HR of AstraZeneca in Chennai. I find that listening skills doesn't come easily to many employees, especially managers for whom this is key. How do we help managers build the skill? Yeah. So I'm rather very good question. I think listening is the most hard pressed thing and great rarity. And one has to work hard to achieve that. So first of all, people really need to be told about the benefits of listening. So we all know that 70-30, but how do we practice 70-30? So in a one hour meeting, uh, we know that we should speak for 18 minutes. In a 30 minutes meeting, we should concise to nine minutes. In a 15 minutes meeting, we should restrict ourselves to four and a half minutes. So first is the awareness. Now you would agree with me to listen more, we need more questions not too many statements. So how do we build our pitches and narratives more in the form of question? The second thing is people tend to speak and they don't listen uh, because they are distracted by their inner chatter. So one simple practice I say, well, I always keep a kind of a blank card around you and a pen, which we don't do these days. So when there's a thought crossing, you just scribble and park it. So you're parking your distractions on a piece of paper. Because most people are worried, what if I'm not able to recollect this thought? So they keep interrupting. The third thing is realization that we don't have to fill the space. For example, let's say if you are speaking, I don't have to say, yes, go ahead, Anuradha, yes, okay, yeah, I'm getting it. No, it's very distracting. Can I hold space for you by staying silent? And in between, I keep asking, well, are you getting me? And one very simple framework, which I give and listening is called RAAS. So R stands for release your agenda. Mm -hmm. You prepare, but just before the meeting, you release your agenda. Second is attend to the speaker. First day. The second is amplify the speaker by asking more questions. Like some meeting, uh, a guy said, oh, we have a struggle. So I listened very like, carefully and I asked, what does the struggle look like? So that's amplification of the question. And S is summarize the speaker. You play back your understanding. So these are some of the tips uh, I think I can share with you in a quick time. 
Thanks, Imanshu. I think uh, one of the most important things that happened during COVID with all, all of us going virtual is that uh, you, you constantly get muted in large meetings. So that's one way to kind of like, you know, improve listening for those of us who have that constant habit of maybe chattering and uh, distracting others that on the lighter note. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It was nice having you as part of this uh, roadshow. Um, I see a couple of more questions. If you're available for a minute, I will just take one last question. Sure, we can take that. What factors have the greatest impact on the choice of well-being programs? This question comes from Thiru Kumaran, who works with the HR of Nokia. The factors that will have impact on the choice of well-being program. I think the first thing is the intent. Why you want to do? Is it a check in the box that we want to do? Or we really want to focus on the well-being of the employee? Second is the design that in a short time, what are the two or three things that we want to achieve in a particular program? The third thing is, is the program immersive in nature? If people can feel and experience something real time, then they walk away with implementable takeaways. If they're too, too much of cognitive content. It's good to hear, but I think it's hard for people to really practice. For example, when I say people five breath of choices and people, they know, okay, from tomorrow morning, actually invoke that. And the very, the last thing is to define the outcomes. Like if people have attended this well-being program, what are three, four outcomes that I would like to see them uh, living from tomorrow? And one of the outcomes is for people to realize that this universe and God has given us an amazing power of breathing. Can we breathe a little more mindfully? The second thing is, if distractions come my way, how do I not let them hijack and I retain my composure, composure by simply saying, give me one moment, let me think. And uh, the question the gentleman has asked, you know, I'm going to share just 30 second story. I was sitting with the CEO of a wealth business company and he said, you know, when I ask questions from people and if they respond in 10 seconds, I don't like them. Well, I feel they have not done justice to my question. But when I see them taking a little breath and they ask, okay, can I take 10 seconds? I really feel very good because now I see that they are doing justice to the question. So maybe this, these are the kind of outcomes we can define of the well-being program. Thanks, Imanshu. It was nice having you with us spend more than this 45 minutes that you committed for the session. And to those uh, 220 odd parties, I mean, registered participants, uh, I, I do not know why many couldn't make it, but those who made it, thanks for making your presence here. But to all of those registered participants, as we committed, Avinash will be sending the discounted passes for Wellcon. So we look forward to seeing you all on 13th October at ITC Grand Chola for the event. Yeah. Lionel always say, there is a moment ordained in the universe that you are supposed to be there. So those who could make it, they were destined to be here and they will definitely walk away something which they can implement in their life from tomorrow onwards. So good luck, all the definitely. best. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Bye.